Hey, Happy Friday. This week we learned that Samsung is in discussions to ditch Google from its phones, the EU stepped into the ring to fight for semiconductors, and Netflix is apparently now making more money from ads than from subscriptions per user. Quite sad. I'm also in Hungary to deal with an unexpected family issue, so I don't have my full filming set up with me, but my face will be back next week. This video was sponsored by NordVPN. Okay, this week we start the brief with the extremely impressive looking Xiaomi 13 Ultra with a new Leica camera setup that uses a one inch main sensor, a variable aperture, plus a raft of high end specs. And this phone will apparently come to markets outside of China as well, finally. Also this week, very reliable rumors indicated that Microsoft is apparently working on an 11 inch Surface Pro as well as an ARM powered Surface Go 4. So finally we'll get a cheaper ARM based Windows tablet then Fairphone had their repairable over-ear headphones called the Fairphone XL leaked all over the place, and much harder to believe rumors also popped up around the next Exynos flagship SoC called the Exynos 2400. This chip is now supposed to come with an RDNA 2-based GPU that has four times the compute units of the last AMD GPU in the Exynos 2200, and it is expected to launch in the Galaxy S24 series already. I take any positive Exynos rumors with a grain of salt, but okay. Then in actual news, Apple launched an Apple Card savings account via Goldman Sachs, which offers an annual percentage yield of 4.15% with no fees. And yeah, just like that, Apple has a pretty competitive offering. Hey, the good news is that all these sudden yields on bank accounts will almost make up for the inflation eating up your savings. Almost. Also this week, Microsoft and Twitter were fighting with Microsoft dropping Twitter from its advertising platform next week, probably because Twitter is charging huge fees for its API now, and with Elon saying that it's lawsuit time because they trained illegally using Twitter data. There's not much more context than that, but oh well. Next, this week, Seagate agreed to pay a $300 million penalty for shipping $1.1 billion of hard drives to Huawei, violating US export control rules. They said that those drives were actually made outside of the US, so they shouldn't have been a problem, but then the US government basically said, nah, -uh, and the US government always wins. So, yeah. And speaking of money, Facebook now owes $725 million to pretty much anyone who's ever been on Facebook in the US. That is, in in total, not per person, of course, but still, you can now claim yours with the link in the description by the 25th of August, or by mail if somehow, confusingly, you both don't have internet, but do have a Facebook account. Next, Apple opened their first official store in India as they apparently saw explosive growth, growing from 2% to 6% market share in the country, where according to CounterPoint, they are now already the number one brand in terms of revenue share. Imagine that, 6% share of the market but most of the money. That's kind of wild. Also this week, pretty much everything that Google will launch at Google I.O. was leaked, so we discuss their upcoming phone, their tablet, and their foldable hardware, but also why a key Google executive left the company and actually switched to Pinterest on my podcast this week, together with a bunch of other news topics. Links to the podcast are down in the description. Okay, my first story of the week is a report saying that Samsung is apparently exploring dumping Google search for Bing and ChatGPT from its Android phones, and Google is understandably in panic mode. Google is now spending almost $50 billion a year on convincing companies like Samsung to set their search engine as their defaults, and this figure makes up 22% of the company's total advertising revenues. That ratio is down from earlier heights, but still this is an insane amount of money, and the reason why they could push it down proportionally year after year is that they just haven't had any strong competitors in many years. Samsung reportedly gets about $3.5 billion a year from their phones, while Apple gets $20 billion for both iOS and macOS, while smaller players like Firefox also make hundreds of millions. For the longest time, Google just didn't really have to compete here, but with Bing AI being the cool kid on the block lately, the news is that Samsung now at least has an alternative. Now, even if Google has to stay, they will at least most likely have to pay extra to fend off the now somewhat credible threat. And the report from the New York Times actually says that inside Google, the news that the South Korean 
Korean giant is even at least considering this deal was creating panic. The thing is that uh, everyone from phone makers to browser companies to Microsoft is directly incentivized to start a serious bidding war, which will mean that even if Google wins all of those fights, they'll still most likely end up having to pay more for everything. That's what having competition does. Okay, for my second story of the week, the EU has started following in the footsteps of China and the United States in handing out billions of dollars for chip manufacturing at home as well. This week, the headlines said that the EU Parliament was committed to making 43 billion euros available to boost semiconductor production within the bloc, and that they aim to go from 10% to 20% market share worldwide by 2030. Also at the same time, German politicians were in Taiwan talking about a TSMC factory moving to somewhere in Saxony, with politicians claiming that these talks are serious and advanced. So things are definitely moving forward in the EU this week, but reading between the lines reveals that TSMC has definitely not committed to a German plant just yet, and the European subsidies are actually far more modest than those of their competitors as well. The 43 billion figure is a bit of a lie, as only about 3.3 billion of those actually come from EU's public funds, and the rest covers subsidies from individual member countries, but also the actual private money that companies are supposed to spend as well. So that is hardly comparable to the US and the Chinese figures. Also, given that we've seen that Intel says that they alone will need about 30 billion euros to build their plant in Germany, which would account for most of that money, and seeing that TSMC alone will spend about this much in just Arizona as well, it is actually unclear how the EU would ever get to its goal of a 20% share. Now, Europe does have major chip companies and equipment makers like ASML, Zeiss, NXP, Siemens, ST Micro, and more, but compared to the hundreds of billions of dollars floating around in China and the US, this proposal all seems somewhat modest. Okay, and for my third story of the week, Netflix has revealed that its ad-supported plans have been a complete home run, as the company is now sometimes making more money per person from ads than from subscriptions. Oh boy. So Netflix announced its earnings this week, which overall showed mixed results, with slight growth and the company reducing its spending on new content. But the actually interesting parts were hidden in this little point. We are pleased with the current performance and trajectory of our per-member advertising economics. In the US, for instance, our ads plan already has a total arm, subscription plus ads, greater than our standard plan. In simple terms, that means that the cheapest Netflix plan that costs $7 a month and also has ads actually brings the company more revenue than not just the basic plan at $10 a month, but it even beats the standard plan at $15.5 a month. That means that the ads alone have to bring in at least $8.5 per person per month, which is more than the actual subscription value, at least for US viewers. That is kind of insane. This success actually resulted in Netflix now being generous with its basics with ads plan, upgrading the video quality to 1080p and switching from one to two concurrent streams because the company is literally making more money from this plan than from the higher paid ones. And the terribly obvious conclusion that almost all all streaming services will draw from this is that they need to both make people pay and put ads in front of them if they want profits. Ew. Streaming these days is more and more becoming like TV. It is expensive, it still has ads somehow, and you can't even watch half the shows that you want because they are geo-blocked based on your location. Well, at least that last problem can be solved by having a good VPN, of course, like the one from Nord. Nord is the fastest VPN around based on independent speed tests, and it is so fast that I routinely forget that I even have it turned on. And on top of that, it of course also has all the countries that you'd want to pick from, and it is also secure and has a great price as well. All your traffic that goes through Nord is encrypted, there is a strict no locks policy so they don't keep records of you, and to back up their claims, Nord has lately even started open sourcing big parts of their software so developers can poke around in it and check if everything is in order. I am not a developer so excuse me if I just flip a switch and watch some shows from abroad, but it's good to know. A Nord account covers six different devices including even your router if you want, so it can cover a whole family, and if you use Use my link nordvpn.com slash Friday checkout, which you can find in the description as well, you'll actually get four months for free with a two year plan. That's a pretty good deal. Four months for free, and there's also a 30 day money back guarantee if you don't like the service. So there's basically no risk in giving it a try. Check them out at the link below, and I'll see you in the next video.